Welcome to this video. This is the final video in my series of videos on Edmund Landau's Foundations of Analysis. In this video, I'm going to go through Theorem 205, which is Dedekind's Fundamental Theorem, which will bring us to the end, really, of the section on real numbers. And th that's where I'm going to finish uh, with this series of videos. Um, this is not the final theorem in the book, Foundations of Analysis. There are s around 30 or so pages uh, after this, which uh, deal with complex numbers and incorporation of the real numbers into the, uh, the, the complex numbers, but I'm not going to go through that part of the, the work. This is where I'm going to finish this series of videos. So what we're aiming to do in this uh, with this theorem is effectively show that our real numbers, our system of real numbers that we've constructed in the, the, over the last few videos, is in a sense complete that there are no gaps there, that there are no numbers missing where we, we should expect numbers to be. Um, so let's have a look at the theorem. Uh, so the theorem simply says, let there be given any division of all real numbers into two classes with the following properties. So the first property is that there exists a number of the first class and also one of the second class. In other words, the first class and the second class are non-empty. Um, and then the second property is that every number of the first class is less than every number of the second class. Then there exists exactly one real number, Xi, such that every eta less than Xi belongs to the first class, and every eta greater than Xi to the second class. So I'm just going to make a few comments um, on this theorem before we actually make a start on the, the proof. The proof is not very difficult of this. Uh, but there are two main parts to it. There's the um, existence part and there's the uniqueness part. So notice here it says there exists um, a real number Xi and we've also got exactly one real number Xi. Uh, so we're going to do these parts separately. We're actually going to do the, the uniqueness first. Um, in any existence and uniqueness theorem, the uniqueness part tends to be considerably easier to do than the the existence and it this follows um, the the format really of, of just about any uniqueness theorem which is assume that you've got two objects that satisfy your criteria and either show that you get a contradiction or that uh, the two objects must actually be one and the same object we also need to be aware of what we are saying here and what we're not saying what we're saying here is that each division of real numbers uh, into this first and second class determines one unique uh, real number. What we're not saying is that each real number determines one and only one division of real numbers. In fact, each real number will determine exactly two divisions. So let's say we, we choose a real number Xi. Then there are two possible divisions that we can, we can form. Uh, the first division is where the eta's of the first class are, are less than or equal to Xi and the eta's of the, um, the second class are greater than Xi. On the other hand, we could form another division where the first class is all of the uh, eta strictly less than Xi and in the second class, we've got all of the eta uh, greater than or equal to psi. So we're not saying uh, anywhere that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between real numbers and divisions of real numbers. Just that each division of real numbers will determine one and exactly one uh, real number psi. Also, we need to... Um, uh, give some consideration to the terminology being used here. So we've already dealt with cuts, for example, cuts of rational numbers. And when we dealt with cuts, we, we had things like uh, uh, ter terms such as the lower class and the upper class um, in relation to cuts. Whereas when we deal with divisions of real numbers, we're dealing with first class and second class. So we, we, we really need to make sure that when we're talking about first class and second class, we understand, understand that we're talking about divisions of real numbers. Um, and these divisions of real numbers, by the way, are effectively classes of cuts or even classes of classes of rational numbers. Whereas when we're talking about lower classes and upper classes, 
what we're really talking about is cuts. And this will be relevant because we will be uh, going back to using cuts uh, in the proof of this theorem. So the terminology, the, there is going to be some mixing up of the terminology and we've got to be absolutely clear about what we're, we're referring to. So cuts are classes of rational numbers, divisions of real numbers um, into the, the classes, the first and second classes. Each of these classes is effectively a class of classes of rational numbers. So let's have a look at the uniqueness part of this theorem. Let's have a look at this uh, uniqueness uh, part of this theorem then. So what we're going to do uh, here is uh, we're going to take a single division of real numbers and we're going to assume that that single division of real numbers determines two different real numbers. So our division is going to determine, for example, Psi 1 and Psi 2. And because they're different, then we, for sake of argument, we'll just say that Psi 1 is less than Psi 2. So because we've only got one division of real numbers here, that means that the, uh, the first class of Psi 1 is equal to the first class of Psi 2. And the second class of Psi 1 is equal to the second class of Psi 2. Remember, we've, we've just got one single division. Also, um, what's going to be important for the, the proof of this is this criteria 2 here, which forbids really any number being in both the, the first class and the second class simultaneously. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a number uh, between Psi 1 and Psi 2. And um, a fairly obvious choice in many ways is just to take the mean of Psi 1 and Psi 2. And it's not difficult to show that Psi 1 is less than this mean, strictly less than, and Psi 2 is strictly greater than this mean. So in other words then, uh, Psi 1 plus Psi 2 over 1 plus 1 it, because it's greater than Psi 1, that means that it must be in the, uh, the second class of Psi 1. And because it's uh, less than Psi 2, it must be in the first class of Psi 2. Okay, so this number is in the second class of Psi 1, but in the first class of Psi 2. But remember, the first class of Psi 1 is the same as the first class of Psi 2. And the second class of Psi 2 is the same as the second class of Psi 1. So what we're saying here then effectively is that this number is in both the first class of Psi 1 and the second class of Psi 1. It's also in the first class of Psi 2 and the second class of Psi 2. But that contradicts this criteria here too, uh, because we can't have a number uh, that, is in, that is simultaneously in both classes, the first class and the second class. So this is our contradiction. So in other words, there can't be uh, two. We can't have two um, different real numbers determined by a single division. So now what we've got to show is that um, the, the, we've got to show the existence. So this, the uniqueness doesn't guarantee the existence, all it's, uh, all it's saying here is that um, if, uh, if two exist, two, two such numbers exist, then that leads to a contradiction. But it might be that there are no numbers. We can't just conclude from this that there is actually a number that satisfies this, this theorem. There might be no numbers, in which case the uniqueness is kind of, um, uh, it's kind of pointless in many ways. But fortunately that's not going to be the case. Let's move on to the existence. So let's have a look at the existence parts of this theorem. Uh, there are four parts for us to, four distinguishable cases that we need to consider uh, with regards to, to this um, existence part to the, the theorem. And what ensues may lead to a little bit of confusion here and there um, for the simple reason that there's going to be a lot of reference to first classes, second classes, upper classes, lower classes. Um, because we're going to be referring to cuts and uh, divisions of real numbers. So there's not really much I can do about this. I, I need to refer to these things by their proper names. 
So if there is any confusion that ensues, then um, apologies for that. But um, all I can suggest is that you try to keep up as best you can. So, okay, the first ca um, case that we're going to consider is when the uh, first class of our division of real numbers contains a positive number. So be aware that um, there may or may not in this first class be a greatest positive number and it may or may not be the case that that greatest number is a rational number. Uh, but what we're going to do now is we're going to form a cut. From this division of real numbers we're going to form a cut. Uh, and our cut is going to consist of a lower class which, is, which contains all of the um, positive rationals from the, the first class of our division of real numbers, so just the positive rationals, remember, with the exception of any greatest uh, rational that might exist in that first class. So if there is a greatest rational in that first class, we remove it and we just take the other positive rationals that are in that first class. And then the second class, uh, sorry, the upper class of our cut uh, is going to consist of the rationals uh, the remaining positive rationals, so the rationals uh, that are in the second class including the uh, greatest rational that was in the first class if it existed. Okay, So it's not difficult to show that this forms a cut, so we've got two non-empty uh, non classes, an upper class and a lower class, and every uh, rational that's in the lower class is definitely less than any rational that's in the upper class and for any rational that we've got in the lower class there is always going to be a greater uh, rational there. Okay so our cut uh, determines a real number. Psi. Okay so what we want to show is that any uh, any other real number uh, eta which is less than psi is going to ultimately be in our first class and any eta greater than psi is going to be in our second class. Psi itself could be in either, doesn't make any difference. That's not particularly relevant to the theorem. The theorem uh, 205 states that there exists a psi such that any number less than psi is in the first class, any number greater than psi is in the, uh, the second class. So if we've got eta less than psi, these can be thought of as cuts. So eta less than psi, um, and theorem 159 says that between any two cuts, we can always find a rational number. So between eta and psi, we can find a rational number z. So that means then, remember we were just using... Uh, this is more the notation from theorem 159, that's why I, I, I switched to this notation. But ultimately what we, what we mean here is that we've got eta, capital eta, is less than z, is less than psi, uppercase psi. Okay, so that means then that because um, z is a rational less than psi, uh, it must be in our cut. It must be in the, the lower class of our cut. So if it's, in the, if it's a rational that's in the lower class of our cut, it must have been in the first class of our original division of real numbers. And because our division of real numbers is such that any number that's in the first class, uh, then any number less than that number is also going to be in the first class. So eta is less than z. z is a number in the first class, therefore eta is also going to be uh, a number in the in the first class. So any number less than psi is going to be in the first class. Let's have a look now at if eta is greater than, oh that's not very well drawn, greater than psi. So if eta is greater than psi we can do a similar thing. Again we can think of uh, these as cuts and we can find a z between, strictly between them. And therefore we get something like uh, eta, capital eta, greater than z, greater than psi. 
Now we've got a little bit of an extra complica um, complication here, because yes, uh, Z is a rational greater than psi, but we need to be sure that Z can't actually be the smallest uh, rational in that uh, upper class. So Z is in the upper class of uh, the cuts defined by uh, Xi. It's in the upper class. But if it was the smallest rational, then we wouldn't actually be able to conclude that because Z is in the upper class that it must have come from the second class of our division of real numbers. We need to be sure that it's not the smallest rational. Well, that's, that's fairly easy to uh, confirm, really, because between Z and uh, Xi here, we can find another rational number. Y. Where Y is in the, um, uh, the upper, upper class to our cut, because it's greater than Xi. And because Z is greater than Y, Z and Y are both rationals, that means that Z must be a rational in the upper class, but not the smallest rational in the upper class. So therefore, Z is a, a, a rational that must have come from the second class of our original division of real numbers, and therefore, because eta is greater than Z, eta must also be in the second, uh, the second class. So what we've shown then is that if eta is less than psi, uh, then eta is going to be in the first class. If eta is greater than psi, eta must be in the second, uh, the second class. And therefore, our division uh, determines a, a unique real number with the, the desired properties. We don't know where psi lies, whether it's in the first class or the second class, but again, that's not really part of the... Uh, the theorem itself, so we're not particularly interested in that. And just to be clear as well, uh, the psi defined by the cut is going to be a positive number, a positive real number. So the second case that we're going to consider is where the uh, our division of real numbers is taken such that the second class is uh, consists of all of the positive numbers, and the first class consists of zero, and therefore all of the negative numbers, okay? And it turns out that zero is the number that satisfies the requirements of the theorem because clearly uh, any number less than zero uh, is gonna be negative and therefore in the first class. Any number greater than zero is gonna be positive and therefore in the second class. So zero is the number that's determined by this particular division and satisfies the requirements of the theorem. The third case, is going to be such that um, our uh, first class consists of all of the negative numbers and our second class consists of zero and therefore all of the, the positive numbers. And this is um, almost identical to the, the second case uh, in the sense that clearly all of the numbers of the first class which are negative are less than zero and all of the numbers uh, greater than zero the positive numbers are in the second class. Okay, so zero again satisfies the requirements of the theorem. That's the, the number for which all of the numbers less than zero are in the first class, all of the numbers greater than zero are in the second class. Even though zero itself could be in the first or the second class, really doesn't make any difference. It's the rest of the numbers, how they relate to zero, that really determines the, the division. And then we move on to case number four. So case number four is going to be um, our division of real numbers is going to be such that in the second class there is a negative number. Okay, in our second class there is a negative number. So, okay, things could again get a little bit confusing here because I'm going to speak of the original uh, division of real numbers and therefore I'm going to refer to an original uh, first class and, uh, and an original second class because we're going to form a new division with a corresponding new first class and a new second class in such a way that if we take the original first class and the original second class then all of the 
numbers in the original first class, we're going to take the negatives of all of those numbers and we're going to group those together and they're going to become our new second class. Okay, so all of the negatives of these numbers become the new second class. So because all of these were originally negative numbers, all of these are going to be positive numbers. And we do the same here. We take the negatives of all of the numbers in the original second class, put them all together to form a new first class. So remember our original second class consisted of positive numbers, zero and some negative numbers. So this is going to consist of all negative numbers, zero and some positive numbers. So that puts us straight back into case number one in this case. Okay, so that means then that this new division that we've got here, new division of real numbers, <clears throat> determines a um, a number, a real number, we'll call it Psi 1, such that any eta less than Psi 1 is going to be uh, in the new first class and any eta greater than Psi 1 is going to be in the new second class. We're also going to uh, define Psi 1, uh, Psi to be equal to minus Psi 1. Okay, so note that Psi 1 would be positive. So minus Psi 1 is going to be negative and therefore Psi is also going to be, going to be negative. Okay, now let's have a look at um, if Eta is less than Psi. So if Eta is less than Psi, that means that Eta is going to be less than minus Psi 1 but that means that eta is greater than, sorry, minus eta is greater than psi 1. So we're just using some of the basic theorems from some of the previous sections. So in other words, because psi 1 is the number that satisfies the uh, criteria, the, the requirements of the theorem, um, where this is our division, then if minus eta is greater than psi 1, then minus eta must be in our new second class. So that means that eta must be in our original first class. In other words, any eta less than psi must be in our original first class. And we can do a similar thing for eta greater than psi Eta is greater than psi, that means that eta must be greater than minus psi 1, and therefore minus eta must be greater than, uh, sorry, less than, don't forget to flip the inequality, must be less than uh, psi 1. Again, remember that this psi 1 satisfies the requirements of the theorem, uh, where our division of real numbers is this new division, so therefore minus eta is less than psi 1 means that minus eta must be in our new first class, which means that uh, eta must be in our original second class. So any number eta which is greater than psi must have originally been in our original second class. So therefore, we, uh, even if we go back to our original division, it seems then that this original division determines the real number psi. Remember, psi is a negative number in this case, and we've verified the requirements of the theorem. And that brings us to the end of this series of videos. Uh, there's not really anything else that I want to uh, talk about really from uh, this particular work. As I mentioned before, there is, uh, there's, there is another couple of sections to this book, another 30 or so pages covering uh, mostly complex numbers, and there's also a bit on uh, series um, and things like that, and incorporating complex uh, real numbers into the the system of complex numbers. Um, but it, it's actually quite it's quite repetitive. I, I find that the uh, the most interesting part of the book is the lead up to the construction of the real numbers, and this is the Dedekind's fundamental 
theorem is effectively the climax of uh, that um, development of the, the real numbers. So I'm going to finish this video and indeed this series of videos there. Um, if, you, if there are any questions that you might have about what I've, I've gone through in any of the, the videos, then please feel free to get in touch with me, uh, leave some comments in the, the comments section or get in touch with me uh, directly. If you have managed to make it this far through the videos, then thank you very much for, for staying with me. Um, I will be making other videos on other uh, works over the coming weeks and, and coming months, and I'd strongly encourage you to watch those if you're, you're interested uh, in that kind of thing. Um, but I'm going to finish the video there, so I'll say thank you very much for, for watching.